Hey, Alice. Oh, hey, hey. Alice. You came at a good time. Uh, we got a special guest this evening, joined by Christian Northover, the one and only great and powerful wizard. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely. I, we've been trying to make this happen for yeah. like ever. <laughs> it feels like. Yeah, man. Um, I've, I've seen you in different stuff for years, like so many different projects. Yeah, I floated around. Yeah. Doing a whole bunch of things. Uh, did you ever see the Blam Blams? I was just about to say, the first time I saw you was at Lipstick Lounge for the Blam Blams in like 2016, 2017. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Pride Fest. Something. Mm -hmm. That was the only time we ever played at Lipstick Lounge. Yeah, that was the first time I saw you play. And then um, like over the years, like Weird Sisters, uh, Spirit Ritual, American Snap, yeah you're you're very prolific and you do a lot of like different stuff those are all very different projects yeah just like playing drums honestly yeah um i grew up playing a whole bunch of different stuff um when i joined my first band in high school it was a punk band and then just a couple months later i actually joined my dad's band which was an eric clapton tribute band so like starting even then and then I played in like another band that was like the Dave Matthews band. And then I played in like, you know, Psycho Stick. Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, they're like a comedy metal thing. Listen to Psycho Stick. The, they did the song Beer. Beer is good. Beer is good. Beer is good and stuff. Also, great song. Listen to it. Beer is good. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just a comedy metal thing inspired by Primus. And we were terrible. <laughs> we tried to be terrible. Uh, people would say we were good and we were like were you listening to our actual set <laughs> uh but yeah i i've always loved playing all different kinds of things and i got my degree in jazz and at that same time i was playing with car seat headrest um uh and yeah just doing all kinds of things i'm playing a hip-hop gig at the end of the month uh October 30th, down at the basement, I'm playing with Mulu. It's going to be a grand little time. Hell yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Um, I'll have to check what's going on, but I'll definitely try to make it to that. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a fun time. That's an awesome. Uh, he's so awesome. Played with him with the Weird Sisters two years ago down at the basement. Hell yeah. Basically two years, two year anniversary of that night. So on, on my own, like in the car, I mostly listen to hip hop. That's like mostly what I listen to. Who's your, who are your go-tos? So, um, I have like, I like more modern hip hop, which I know is like almost taboo. Like people <laughs> want to point to the greats, like, and there are like so many great, like MF Doom. Yeah. That, that's my go-to. MF, MF Doom is great. Um, but yeah, I like MF Doom, like spawned that whole, like, I don't know. I don't, not entirely him, like three, six mafia. And, um, uh, uh cypress hill you know but like they in like the 90s originated like the weird shit yeah you know what i mean like that psychedelic stuff i love flatbush zombies um underachievers um tyler the creator you know oh um, yeah uh recently i really like this artist called grimwood salvo or uh grim salvo okay That's what called. i have to check it out yeah it's i like all the bells and whistles of like the tricky interesting beats that we got going on right now yeah speaking of weird <laughs> trippy shit uh you are releasing a project will come out tomorrow uh new piece you made uh yeah uh it's called wizards made me do it and it's an album of just drums and guitar pedals it's only 22 minutes long so give me a chance uh but it's it's an exercise in pure creativity with just a couple of my friends and it was so much fun to make and what I, we had no idea no expectations going into it of what it would sound like what we were gonna actually make but it sounded it sounds super cool and so i'm super excited you got to hear it yeah i really enjoyed it every song was uh there was it was different every song on there was very different um i was kind of like the first track i really liked that nasty like industrial kind of 
gritty sound and i thought that was going to be like kind of the thing going forward but every every track was very different that. yeah that was kind of the uh the idea it's because i kind of had the when i finished the album i looked through it there were eight actual tracks and then one track that is a joke for one of my friends um of those eight like actual tracks um quote unquote because they're all real and they all mean the same but there's one that is definitely a straight up inside joke for childhood friends for when i would go over to his house and just hit his symbols for 15 minutes and call it symbols <laughs> mysterioso so <laughs> that that is specifically for him um it max crozy that was an expensive gag please listen to that damn song <laughs> um but yeah it was when i had those other eight it kind of like broke into four different categories of two each there were two that were groovy and just crunchy two that were like these odd time metal songs, two that were kind of flowy and really melodic, and two that were just total clusterfuck experiments. Can I swear? Absolutely fucking oh. not. Oh, okay. Um, Better well, fucking not. Fuck. Um, but yeah, uh, so we had, and then I thought about it and I didn't want to overwhelm anyone from the beginning. And it's so short that I thought like I could keep attention just by, changing it so it goes up with a pattern of like crunchy groove melodic odd time craziness and then experiment and then it repeats that crunchy groove melodic um odd time experiment or odd time thing and then uh experimental and then it ends with symbols mysterioso the gag that's so cool i'm gonna have to like listen to it again with that in mind and like that that's awesome yeah it was I just didn't want to wear out anyone's ears because it's very easy to wear out someone's mm. ears with something like this. Um, but it keeps you on your toes, I think, listening through it that way. That's interesting. Why do you think that is? Because um, it's like they're it's it's all interesting. Do you think it being interesting and, and like uh, requiring a level of attention is what makes people wear out on it? I think a little bit of that, but also if you just have, if I had two tracks back to back that sounded like grinding noises mm -hmm. in odd time signatures, like at the beginning, people might not be interested in saying <laughs> that it might be, as you said, like you, as you assumed maybe this is going to be how it's going to be all the way through, but changing it up that dramatically right away. It's like, okay, this is not going to be this way all the way through. This track is only a minute and 20 seconds. Like I want to, and I just want to get these ideas out there. Cause that was the cool thing was just experimenting and like people should get back to experimenting oh, with, yeah. with just making crazy noises. I, I really did appreciate that about it is uh, I haven't really heard anything like that. And you were definitely like it's fringe uh experimental yeah, yeah it was it's it, very weird <laughs> it was very weird it was very fun to do um and i should also mention that i'm not the first person to think mm -hmm. about putting drums through guitar pedals people have done that forever um dan mayo look him up um he's a drummer on instagram tiktok whatever but he does a lot of that stuff he's really good at it he's got a couple of great albums sorry about that ding I oh you're good guys um oh mute that and then another guy eric and prada um he's an absolute beast he was a guitar center drum off uh guy but like does backflips between drum kits <laughs> and like he has this like 25 minute long drum solo with the pedals and stuff that is really cool but it, it is different in than how we did it they were reacting to pedals live whereas we recorded everything and then pumped it through pedals so we could pump things through tons of ideas really yeah and then carve out the ones that we wanted which was probably the biggest pain in the whole process because after the recording day of pedals we just had these bricks 
of noise mm-hmm. that we then had to carve out. Yeah, that's probably, I can imagine that being a lot of work. And then not on top of that, it's like, what do you call any of these things? Mm. What do I call the sound of a bass drum running through a delay and then through a whole bunch of other pedals? Like, what is that instrument actually called? So there's lots, lots of like space duck one and like underwater gong like yeah. that type of instrument naming just to be able to go back and forth so it was just it was creative in every aspect even just that like what do we call these instruments for yeah. editing purposes names are such an interesting thing that's exclusive to people like art in general is like a, a human thing you know yeah. but like naming is so powerful uh, yeah yeah it's a lot of magic in just names speaking of that how did you where did the name of the album come from uh so the i was going back and forth on a whole bunch of different names um and then i can't even really remember my uh i when i decided i wanted to do this I guess one of the pedals that I really wanted was a rainbow machine by Mm. Quaker devices. It's a pink pedal. It's a pitch mesmerizer. And the best way I can describe it is that there's a little wizard doing LSD. (laughs) That's like really messing with your guitar. (laughs) So when that was like, for me, that's the only pedal I own. (laughs) That is the only guitar pedal I own. So I was like, okay, this is for me, the forefront on, you know, a bunch of stuff that we did on that. And then I had my friend, Rob Stewart. Um, He brought in the main pedal board and was helping me with that. And he did a bunch of pedal stuff on there. And then Alex Sanchez of Porter Rose Studios um, doing it. And is that where you recorded it? That's where I recorded it. Yeah. Yeah. Alex does great work. Alex does great work. And it it was so, it was such a joy working with him. Mm. Um, And we're definitely going to do more of these because it was just so much fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just, they were so encouraging and I had this little LSD wizard in a box and it was just like wizards ultimately made me do it and help, helped me out. Yeah. And then, uh, well, it was originally going to be wizard, a uh, wizard made me do it. And then I was talking to the person who was doing my album artwork and I gave them pictures of my cats. And I said, you have to pick one of these to be the wizard that made me do it. <laughs> I can't pick because I can't play favorites with my cats. Uh, and she was like, we can just do both. And I was like, okay, Wizards made me do it. Yeah. So um, the album art is both of my cats, Abbott and Charlie. That's awesome. So the artwork for the album actually affected the name. That's so cool. Yeah, it definitely. And just the story of that artist getting to work with her because uh which is really cool, by the way. I love that picture. It's, it's a awesome. it's a cool picture, right? It was based on the uh, the dare lion coming out of the circle. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's two house cats handing you a cigarette <laughs> instead. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, opposite of dare, it's just peer pressure. Give into it. Do it. Let let the creative urges take hold. Does she like take commissions? um yeah she does um you want to plug like instagram or something yeah her name is sarah cohen um i only uh cherry sprocket is her art account and electronome is her other account um she just uh never actually met her i have no idea where she actually is she just followed me on instagram from one of the videos i posted and i put out feelers for artwork looking for something cartoony and it just worked out that way hell yeah 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 I I like it it's the whole the whole thing just comes together nicely like the name the picture the album I I love the whole package it's awesome yeah it's all fallen together and thank you it's been no it's been uh it's been wild to get it and now that it's actually coming out tomorrow October 25th 2024 uh it's it's very cool hell yeah so you said you uh, got your jazz. Or where'd you go to school? Uh, I went to William and Mary. It's not a music school, um, just old school, prestigious school. Um, I went there for math and music. 
Um, technically did not get my math degree. I found out the day before graduation, I was not getting my math degree. Um, but that's not, that hasn't affected me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> right. Uh, and I am an accountant <laughs> already. So yeah, still, uh, but yeah, uh, I got the jazz degree from there and it was, it was cool. Got to meet a lot of really, really interesting players and uh, was really lucky to play with Carsey Edrest at that point in time, like well before they like blew up. Um, and yeah, it was a cool little scene. It's right in the middle of Colonial Williamsburg. So you would wander off the college campus um, at two in the morning, you know, having after having a lot of fun at a party, and suddenly you were transported back into the 1700s. Oil nice. lamps and cobblestone streets. That's and, fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, what what state is that? Uh, Virginia. Virginia. Is that where you grew up? No, I grew up in Massachusetts. Maine bounced between the two. Right on. What brought you here? Uh, music. It was after after college living up in Maine for a little bit and uh I was just playing music every night basically mm. out somewhere and I was like okay so let's go somewhere else yeah and was thinking about here and Austin and you know other other music cities and came here to visit with my dad and just absolutely fell in love with it got to get up and jam with a bunch of players like right off the bat had a gig before I even got here and yeah, so it just worked out. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I don't want to like sit here and like puff you up too much, but I'm a really big fan of what you do, man. Oh, thank you. I I'm mean, not I trying to like you. fanboy, but like, I really, you're very talented. Thank you. Um, uh, I've worked hard. It's weird being in a band with your dad. <laughs> there's a weird, there's a weird pressure that you end up carrying on to every band you end up playing with. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like influences everything going forward. Yeah. I can see that in a weird way, especially because like I started playing with him professionally when I was like 14 mm -hmm. playing in clubs, I was not allowed to be in. Yeah. So would like set up the drums, wait in the car, play a set, wait in the car, play a set, wait in the car, play a set, break down the drums, wait in the car, drive him home. <laughs> Yeah, what kind, okay, so obviously Eric Clapton, but what kind of music was, like, in the car growing up, or, like, it played in the house? Oh, so, um, well, my dad is really a blues guy and really a British blues guy. Like, mm -hmm. that. that's really his bread and butter. He is from England, and he was in that whole scene. So he was, he saw, like, Tull and Zeppelin and small clubs. Dude, that's awesome. He saw he saw the show where Hendrix sat in with Cream. He was there Yo. in that room. Like, dude, that that gives yeah. me chills. That's crazy. Like, he was asked to join a band called The Herd, and he couldn't do it because he was working with his other band. The person that took that job was Peter Frank. Like, he was <laughs> he was like brushing shoulders with all these people. So, like that was always like the big thing and like Clapton was God was like kind mm. of how that was I was raised in that household um in that way so it was a lot of it was a lot of blues and then um my mom kind of my mom listened to a lot of new age music which was really cool I, I think that's why I love post rock now mm is because I love those ambient soundscapes that she yeah. listened to while cleaning, and that's like the heavier version of that. Um, it's like a well-rounded mix. Yeah, and then I had, all my brothers are so much older. So, like, they would introduce me to different things at different points in my life when they thought it was appropriate mm -hmm. to me. How many siblings do you have? I have three siblings. The youngest of my brothers was a freshman in college when I was born. Oh, shit. That's wild. Yeah. So, so like... Like how, what's the age gap? 18 years. Damn. And then with my oldest brother, uh, that's 23 years. That is a big jump. Yeah. So like I was, I've been an uncle since I was 10. <laughs> I have nine nieces and nephews. <laughs> yeah. Was it a religious household at all? No. No, that's, no. That's good. <laughs> my, um, 
so my dad's from England. My mom is from Slovenia. Mm -hmm. Um, my dad went to like a religious English school back in like the fifties and sixties and was the like one black kid in that English school. So he ended up not loving church after sure. that. And obviously joined like a counterculture movement that was going on at the time. Yeah, it was definitely doing that, driving a big old van at the time. And like, uh, I mean, he was working professionally and he really did like lean more towards corporate out of the music, like making money, being successful, making sure that he could live his best life. It's like very yeah. important. And then. I think during the seventies, he kind of dropped off and didn't play as much music, just focused on his career that way. But then eighties, nineties, two thousands onwards, he's been crushing it musically. So, and then my mom uh, grew up in Slovenia, former Yugoslavia. Um, she's just, des she's described it as almost a communist country, but like I haven't, found any sources to prove that so don't get mad at me anyone <laughs> um she moved over here in 72 with my oldest brother um not speaking any english or anything. oh wow and so it was that she just had a, an entirely different life damn that's gotta be so wild yeah just um, picking up and going somewhere yeah and it, so like her um so all my brothers are half brothers so her and her husband at the time were moving over here. He moved over first to kind of get settled and everything. And then she moved over with my brother. So she's from an Eastern European country, doesn't speak any English, wearing all red in 1972. Damn. Her flight goes to the wrong airport in 1972. So you have no, you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> wow. And... Yeah, so her flight goes to the wrong airport. No one will give her the time of day <laughs> once she's there. And so, like, just that whole story of her coming over is kind of wild to me. Like, that is hard wild. To think about. Yeah, man, like, uh, like, just the lifestyle. We, we have it so good. Oh, we, like, we, and we, we do. Things, there's it, a lot of shit that sucks. We oh, uh, for well, sure. I absolutely acknowledge that. But, like, we do have things very good. I think it's it's easy to, we do have a lot of problems. Yeah. We, got a lot, we have a lot of work to do as a society for sure. But also this is like the best time it's ever been. Yeah. Uh, we have it so good. And like the people that come before us, like there's a reason that like that music in the seventies was so experimental and like in the sixties. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. The, what do you think? What do you think brought that on? Like, what do you think made it so experimental about that time? Well, yeah, like, obviously, like, Vietnam was a big part of it. Like, the hippie movement was a response to what was going on. And, um, like, I'm, I'm a really big fan of Malcolm X and um, Dr. King as well, but specifically Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, not just the music at the time but there was a whole revolution taking place in that time period and the music is a reflection of the zeitgeist that was going on it's weird because the music is responsive to what's happening but then the music also changes what's happening like it's cyclical you know yeah um and i think i think also people were more open to putting that out which helped that a lot you yeah know? everything becomes commercialized a little bit after that which i think is why it's a little bit more formulaic is there was like that that era of like the way you the goal is to like get signed to a major label like mm -hmm. which is like a dumb goal to have <laughs> but like you know companies want to play it safe you know they want to which is like the opposite it, it doesn't make any sense. No, it's really interesting. I heard this. I'm going to talk about content because I'm going to yeah. talk about social media for a second. Um, but it definitely, I think it relates to music. Go off. There's, the, there's this really interesting phenomena that's happening right now where we are 
very lightly telling a machine what we like and then it's feeding us stuff and then rewarding people that make that stuff mm -hmm. to make more stuff like it so like are people actually making stuff for people now or are they making it for machines and machines are telling us what like what we're supposed to like in yeah. a way it's it's very pervasive in like the instagram drumming community or the tiktok drumming community because it's all either it's all flash or humor like there are very few people that like make their way just being really good at drums <laughs> it's really interesting that's not talking like about me but it's just like what you see it's all people like able to go off which is what instagram and the algorithms like to see and what people grab onto because they want to see what happens next but it's not what people actually latch onto. no one goes and listens to someone shred drums for 60 minutes and go that was the most relaxing experience of my life no no one cares about that um it's just interesting and i think all music is the same way as they're saying they have all this data now as what has worked and that has influenced what is going to work next and what comes out and we are now a decade into this after Spotify gave us all this analytics two decades if you want to count iTunes and what they've what they have and yeah so we're kind of in this weird little bubble where yeah it's a feedback loop yeah that is wild man it's uh it's also like like uh like Disney for example has been putting out garbage for like 10 years now and not learning their lesson and it's because they're not making it. It's like kind of what you're touching on. They're not making content for people. They're making content for shareholders. Yeah. Same thing in the game industry. Like, yeah, it's crazy. Every game has to be everything mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. It's, there's and that that is really destructive to art. Um, so, I, yeah, yeah, I just really appreciate people making interesting things nuanced yeah. novel novelty and you know those are going to be the things that actually shape like what people like you know yeah. like because people don't like being fed the same shit all the time like when it when it's derivative you know no for sure and it's it's hard because it feels like there's a part of this that is on us as consumers mm. Yeah, um, that's true. Because like how, I mean, like Nashville, there is so much creativity here and there is so much not creativity. I'm not going to call it, I'm not going to call it garbage because there's a lot of people <laughs> that are living their best life, making a career, playing music. Like mm. they're, they're a hero in their small town. You know, and they're they're able to do that and they're maybe they don't love it. Maybe we don't love anything that they're playing, <laughs> but like they're still doing it. But there's also so much creativity and so many weird things and new things. And you can go into the Cobra any given night and see something weird. And there's three people there. <laughs> yeah, dude. So like what is crazy? It's like, how do you... And this is something that I struggle with because I struggle with finding new things. How do you find new things? What do you, mm. what, and whether that's locally or outside? That's a great question. I do a lot of, uh, like with music, for example, I don't do a lot of exploration. Um, like I will put on the same shit that I always listen to. Yeah. I'm not very explorative with music. Um, kind of with, kind of like with games too. Um, I know what I like and I stick to like certain genres. It is hard. It's hard. Um, Do you feel less inclined to go out there as you are getting older and like finding man. like, is there is part of this is that there is such comfort in these things yeah, that it is. And like, it kind of feels like working a little way to do research. I, I, 
you know, I, I think I have an answer for you. Um, like we do a book club on the podcast every month. Every yeah. month we read a different book. And I very, very seldomly will pick the book. It's almost entirely recommendations. Um, and that has been so useful and enjoyable and helpful to expanding because like if I was picking the book every month we would like just do fantasy novels like that's yeah. my wheelhouse but like we've done non-fiction like self-help stuff um like autobiographies uh just everything you know yeah, yeah yeah um and that so I think for me it's it's recommendations um people suggesting things to me um, that I wouldn't normally find on my own. That's, yeah. that's how I find new things is they get recommended to me. Yeah. Yeah. There's so, cause I mean, you know, you don't have to call it garbage, but there is so much garbage to <laughs> sift through. Yeah. I mean, there is, there, there is a lot of 150,000 songs get released on Spotify every day, every day, every day. Dude, that's <laughs> crazy. Yeah. There is that's a wild most there's something like 10 percent of songs that don't get five plays or something like that some crazy statistic like that wow like or it might even be like one play like people upload music that they themselves never listen to even mm -hmm. once to get that ball rolling sure and like there is a part of that that is an exercise in creativity there's a lot of people that are throwing out a lot of shit there's a lot of people using ai to make shit now and yeah like that's a whole other interesting conversation a friend of mine has been getting into sync like um, oh yeah sync stuff and that's like a whole different world dude yeah like making music for sync is like like he has he'll like make a song and release like it'll be the same song like the full version and then he'll release like a 10 second version yeah of it, like clips of that same song but they're all like Listening. yeah you have to and you have to do like different kinds of mixes and like different sections that'll loop really well mm -hmm. and everything yeah my my brother is in tv he's in that world mm. um so he sifts through sync stuff i bet uh he he does not have to anymore he works as oh, um an executive producer he, oh, um, I got you. You know that's the, awesome you know the dog whisperer like Caesar Milan, that's his show. Yeah, I used to watch that. <laughs> yeah, that's my brother's show. Holy shit! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's executive producer for Dog Whisperer. Uh, I don't know if he EP'd that one, but he definitely found and worked as a, one of the producers on that one. Yeah. Did do they still make that show? Uh, I think it might be a different thing. He's not on it anymore, but he also did like Wicked Tuna and like a bunch of those like Nat Geo reality shows. You're right on. And now he's just doing stuff for Discovery Channel, Travel Channel, PBS um that's awesome curiosity stream yeah it's cool i i used to watch dog whisperer back in the day um if you uh i don't know how you feel about cats but there's a guy I named cats there's a guy named jackson galaxy who <laughs> is the cat cat whisperer awesome he's he's got the craziest mutton chops with the design shaved into it <laughs> and like he shows up with a guitar case full of cat toys <laughs> he's like the craziest looking dude um love him jackson galaxy all kinds of plugs over here something i've been um I, i'm i'm interested to know this is something i've just been that's been running through my mind and I'm, I'm trying to get different perspectives on it um I believe in objectivity mm -hmm. and I'm realizing the more I talk to people, not everyone does, but I think some things are true. And what I mean by that is whether there are people to observe it or not, these are constants. So examples of this would be like physics, where even though we don't understand the laws of physics, mm -hmm. there are laws that exist. Um, meaning like, we can ship away at something that is real. Like, so we may not understand how things work, but it does work a certain way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Do you agree with that? It's a hard one. Um, because like I said, I studied math. Yeah. That's actually where I was going with this is math. And like, I don't know if one plus one equals two is an objective truth. Okay, that is very interesting. Let's get into that. 
Um, one is our understanding of something. All numbers are made up. Let's let's start with that. Mm. All numbers are made up. But isn't that a representation of something that is true? Like, I know it gets in the weeds when we're talking about, like, advanced math, like, like imaginary numbers and things that don't represent something that exists, right? Mm -hmm. But, like, um, and I don't mean to cut you off, but I, I think maybe what we're talking about is, like, there is, if I say there's, like, one chair, it's like, yeah, but it's composed of, like, a thousand different or millions of molecules. It's not one thing. Right. But, but conceptually, there is one, right? Well, what if... Let's yeah, dive into let's the do this. theory for a second. Like, like, what if there exists in our universe some being that can see in some other dimensional, uh, like, above us? Like, this is a big assumption. Mm. So... Like, say it can look at that and then see it in, what would it be? The fifth or sixth dimension where it could see po every possible iteration of that chair all at once there. So it is, it's possible for it to see infinite chairs. If that thing exists, is it an objective truth that there is one chair? because we're limited in our understanding against it. In this infinite sequence of chairs. Yeah. Couldn't you point to one of in within that sequence? I mean, it could theoretically grab an instance of it, but is it still I mean, at that, this is tough. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it gets it gets weird. Uh, the, these definitions are weird. So that's why I would say I don't know if there are necessarily okay. objective truths because of how limited we are in our sure. understanding. Like they just mapped the first 1% mm. of the universe. I don't know if you saw that. No. Yeah, they got a port. They were like, okay, officially, here is a portion of the map. Of the entirety? Like that, they think as, they as have, far as they know of, of like, the observable universe yeah okay. and they were like here's like this trillion galaxies all exist right here mm. <laughs> like that is crazy that that in itself like shakes up like oh that's i mean i understood like before that that kind of was the case but now that there is like a picture <laughs> in perspective yeah, there, yeah there's a tiny bit like the teensiest bit of perspective that like with the idea that there could be life out there like what uh -oh. are our truths because <laughs> yeah it's, it's like a statistical impossibility that there is not other life out there yeah so i would say okay let's let's let me change my answer there might be objective truths for humans asterisks <laughs> but doesn't that make it subjective then Sub uh, if it's just does, through our lens, that means it's not objectively when, true. So are we a whole or are we individuals as part of a whole? Mm, well, because we're, we're part of a collective, but you can still point to the individuals within the collective, right? Yeah. So when at what scale does subjectivity become objectivity and vice versa? Mm, I see what you're saying about perspective. That's a, that's why I'm like throwing that big old asterisk on there. Like for humans, mm. objectively, one plus one equals two. I will go with that. In the grand scheme of the universe, I. It's one of those things I feel arrogant about saying in a, in a weird mm. way, because there's also. And th this is. For me, there's this joy that there is infinite realities all existing all at once that something may be able to travel through in different instances of. And like, yeah, I, okay, I, I think I understand what you're saying. But I guess what I'm saying is regardless of scale, let's say there are infinite universes if you look at just one of those universes, it's like, okay, well, there's one here and there's yeah. one here. 
And if you combine those, that's two of them within this infinite sequence. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it is tough. It's not an easy question to answer. Yeah. And I, I think I have faith in objectivity. Okay. And that's kind of like, if we don't, if there is no truth, if there is no objective truth, I mean, science becomes, I think science is an assumption that there is objective truth and we're working towards something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, w- I would agree with that. And in that I would also say because we are chipping away at it and there is so much like there is so much that we can fall goes up it comes down Mm -hmm. we know that we know that massive bodies in in space orbit around each other because of gravity how does gravity actually work and so it's like objective truth that is there an objective truth that gravity exists? Yes. Caveat. What if we find out it's actually like right. six different voice forces? Yeah. Like, it's, it's a theory of how things are interacting. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think there is objective truth within our limited understanding, but like outside of that, mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what it would be other than like, I don't know. I don't want to get too deep in the weeds and be I, like, I exist because maybe I don't exist. Oh, I mean, Descartes, like, I think therefore I am has always been like, a what does that even mean? That's a word salad. Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? So that's not an objective truth for me. But physics is a good example, I think, of objective truth, where even if we don't understand gravity, I think beyond human perspective, it does. there are laws to the universe. It is a constant that it works a certain way and maybe in other dimensions and other universes, it works a different way. But I think in the physical plane that we inhabit, there are constant laws. Um, And I think it would really like break my mind to find out that that's not the case. Like, like, and that, that happens sometimes like um, without getting into like the like legitimacy of it, let's just say hypothetically, like the UFO things where it's like, zipping around it's Mm -hmm. not propulsion it's not affected by it has no resistance when it goes underwater it moves exactly the same speed right yeah it's like that in in our understanding breaks the laws of physics but like no it doesn't right that just means the universe works a way that we haven't understood yet right but i think it does work a certain way no i i I 100 percent agree with you so like in that instance if that was to happen like would that understanding of physics if if our understanding of something is able to be broken is that an objective truth Mm. i don't know if we'll ever understand things fully but i think regardless of if we do or not it does work a certain way well spend drink (laughs) there it is I think yeah, it's it's neither here nor there whether people figure it out or not. I guess is what I'm saying. Mm. I just I guess I have faith that it does work a certain way. Um, which is funny because if there are constants, I think that line of reasoning <laughs> eventually becomes like a religious thing. Like it doesn't have to have like a specific religious connotation. But if it ha- if there are constants and things work a certain way, it almost looks like design. Yeah. So <laughs> it's it's like almost. It, like the further I entertain that line of reasoning, I think it becomes like a design thing. Do you have any favorite visions of God? Like what God could mm. be? I have one I'm very confident about. Yeah. Um, and this is informed by uh, DMT experiences. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, it just makes sense. Also, I think this is what every religion is saying, even if people don't understand that that's what religion is saying. Mm -hmm. Um, I think John, John Lennon said it best. I am he as you are he as you are me and we are all together. So I think there is this like Nirvana source consciousness that inhabits everything 
So what makes you and I different or what makes me different from a blade of grass uh, or a cat is like biology and lived experience. But the soul that drives everything, I think, is uniformly like identical. And that thing we can call God. Okay. I also think this is what Jesus was saying. Uh, I think this is like Buddhism. <laughs> I think all of them are kind of saying the same thing. Yeah. Like, like Jesus, like treat other people the way you want to be treated because that's you. Right. And also like the son of God thing is like, like there's the Trinity, like, um, like God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit. And it's like, they, they even call it the mystery of the Trinity. Like they admittedly don't understand it. Yeah. But I think it's really simple actually is like this thing there is no separation between creator and creation. Everything is one thing observing itself through infinite angles, I think is um, that <laughs> now that doesn't give me any comfort because what that means is the universe that generates everything is also responsible for all of the evil that's been done. Right. Um so I think uh, David Bowie has this song called uh, A Width of a Circle. And it was actually the inspiration for um, uh, Montero by Lil Nas. Okay. Uh, the, that video is uh, inspired by the song A Width of a Circle by David Bowie. And um, in, in, that, in that song, he has a line where he says, and then I realized that God is a young man too. Okay. And yeah. it's like, and he has, he says another part in there where he's like, I saw a beast sleeping beneath a tree and I looked and saw that it was me. And I said, hello. And I said, hello. Like I said, <laughs> hello. And I said, hello. And then uh, like a raven cackled Khalil Gibran, which uh, he was a, a uh, philosopher that kind of like a modern day philosopher that kind of was saying a similar thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's what's going on is uh, where I was going with that is uh, God is this lunatic that is hallucinating reality. <laughs> and it is, there is no one to save us because it is just trying to figure itself out. Yeah. It's like a work in progress. <laughs> uh, what about you? <laughs> uh, well, that when, it, when I think about it as like, how do I visualize God? Like my, my instinct is that is like as a person first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So with what you just said that it's a work in progress of the hallucination, I sometimes find it, I don't necessarily find it comforting, but in some strange way I do. Mm. I imagine God as a scientist with billions of Petri dishes mm. and each one is its own reality. So one this one Petri dish is our universe, that it was one of God's experiments. But there are so many mm. of them laying out on this table that are different iterations of fucking around and finding out, seeing seeing what happens with all these different uh, conditions that you place on it. But when I think about it, like from how I actually feel about like my vision of the universe and what is, it's really just like a point on a piece of paper. Mm. Um, I don't, there's a video that's like 15 years old. It's a, uh, old YouTube video pencil drawn of the 10 dimensions. Um, and the 10th dimension is just a point that contains every possible universe of with every possible rule set, every timeline within every possible universe and every physical thing that could have existed in any of those timelines mm -hmm. and every possible universes. And like, after that, we can't envision what is beyond things, time, and the rules that made it be. 
Like we don't have an understanding of something larger <laughs> than that. So it's every possible universe is basically all we can comprehend. So it's a point on a piece of paper until someone can break into the 11th dimension and it starts treating it. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whoa. That's wild. Yeah. So obviously no one has the answer, but what makes the most sense to you about like what happens after we die? Um, none of it makes sense. Well, Honestly, yeah. I, uh, agree. I totally agree. Like it is so <laughs> weird. And like, I don't know, some of it, some of it is from weird things of like me reading Angels and Demons by Dan Brown when mm. I'm 13 years old and they talk about the measurement of a soul leaving the body. Yeah. Um, and it's like, is that actually a thing? And it's like, but what if there is like some some way we're not able to measure something? Like the scientific part of the brain in me both wants to go, we don't know and nothing. Mm. Um, and then there's another part of my brain that like, doesn't want to think too hard about it and just wants to postulate ridiculous possibilities yeah. of it. Um, it's more fun that way. Yeah. <laughs> like you just get sent, you get reincarnated, but at a random point in time. Oh, wow. Like retroactively. Yeah. That's wild. So like, I mean, if, if time is like a landscape and it's, only linear because we perceive it that way like i don't see why that would be impossible yeah like what if thomas edison was actually just someone that worked in a light bulb factory 100 years <laughs> oh, later oh, shit and he just had some residual memory in there that had him put together this Whoa. light bulb <laughs> but, <laughs> have you ever heard of i think it's called the egg theory no it's basically like um like everyone is the same person but in like a like a linear progression so like God is experiencing everything, but like one at a time. So we're like handing off consciousness in our reality. Yeah. What? Yeah. So like right now I'm me, but like I either was you or will be you at some point. Okay. I, I don't, yeah. That's crazier. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's more like, like uh, at the same time uh, kind of thing. Uh but yeah <laughs> no i like trying to figure out the logistics of how this works no let's keep it <laughs> linearly throughout <laughs> how do you program that I don't know. yeah <laughs> speaking of programming uh what do you think about simulations uh try to prove we're on we're not in one you can't sorry <laughs> yeah it's impossible <laughs> yep so uh Try not to think too hard on it. <laughs> I actually learned something really interesting. You probably know a lot more about this. Um, this blew my mind, though. Like, I didn't ever think about it. It's kind of obvious. I think some of the most profound truths are, like, really simple. Yeah. And then you're like, whoa. Definitely. Right? But, like, uh, I just learned recently that, um, like, you know how, like, like, like pixels, like, there, there's no real, like, circles, in the digital space no you look yeah. closer at it and it's like you know i just learned that sound is the same way like digital sound is not actually a wave it the more closely that's what resolution and sound is oh. is it is like that's why 8-bit sounds so chunky because it's like the resolution's low right 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 but the resolution is so good now that it's beyond like we wouldn't be able to detect it but it yeah. is still it's not a wave it's like jagged yeah. And that got me thinking about there is round in reality and you can make a straight line, but they don't actually occur nor naturally. Right. Um, and even if you make a straight line, you look closely enough at it. It's not, it's, yeah. it's a curve. I mean, they have, they have the world's roundest object locked away. I don't know if you knew that. What? There, there is like a, like it's in the fucking Vatican. <laughs> and, and, yeah, no, it is a it's like an aluminum it's an aluminum sphere. I believe it was aluminum they had to cast it out of to make it as smooth as they could possibly get. And it's like 99.99999% spherical. But that's the closest thing we have to a sphere like on this planet. 
and it's locked away in some box somewhere that Holy scientists shit. are like, this is the sphere that we talk about in textbooks. Like when we say assume the spherical cow, this is the sphere. You know? Whoa. <laughs> That's crazy. And it, we have all kinds of stuff like that. Like we have the kilogram. There is a thing that weighs a kilogram that is in a box, in a museum, like in a vault somewhere. That is the defining Damn. kilogram. Like it's just right on the money. <laughs> yeah. Like That's crazy. That is like what we base it off of. Holy shit. <laughs> I guess these things kind of like it's important that they exist that, like, like that. Yeah. Um, the uh, what where I was going with that is because you can't make something there's no curves in the digital and everything is curved in reality. What that implies to me is that we're not in a digital space. Like it's not binary. Mm -hmm. So if it is a simulation, it's not a digital one. What if the resolution is just really good and you just can't see the individual pixels? Oh, like it actually is lines. We're, we're living in like 36 K. <laughs> <laughs> damn like it is actually lines i mean yeah and then when and when you and i both wear glasses our resolution is just dropping as we're as we're going through <laughs> fuck <laughs> yo <laughs> damn okay well now i'm back on we might live in a digital space then. <laughs> fuck okay um so we talked about this a little bit before we started but do you have any, have you ever had an experience in your life that you can't like rationalize like a supernatural experience? Uh, I used to say ghost stories, but that kind of puts like a connotation and assumption on it. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, there's definitely things that have happened that I've since gotten explanation about. Um, but, and there are things that I don't remember that I've been told secondhand that have happened. Mm. So yes and no. I gotcha. That. Um, I grew up in a haunted bar. Okay. I grew up in one of the most haunted buildings in New England. Whoa. Yeah. I think you told me a little bit about this. Yeah. At some point. Like, it was a John Stone's Inn. It was an old inn built in the 1800s on the train tracks in Ashland, Massachusetts. My parents owned it from when I was like four to 11 or 12 or something like that um and yeah super haunted and um my cousin was telling me this uh, just the last time i was up in up visiting my family um there was it's a haunted building so history channel came through one time or a couple of times to do a special on it um and I, they were filming, they were setting up, they were doing all their thing. And apparently like, I'm like five, six years old or something like that. I grabbed some flyers um, from that night for, and went downstairs for whatever band was playing there. And I handed them out to the crew members. And apparently I walked over to an empty chair that was pulled out and I said, Three. I handed them three flyers. They got three of them and then walked away back to what I was doing. <laughs> Whoa. Um, like you set them on the table? No, I handed them out to people and then I walked over to the empty chair and was telling it that I handed out the three flyers. Oh, okay. You were, you were informing it. Yeah, I was informing this empty chair that I had handed out the flyers that it was asking for. And this place has like there's a lot of experiences like yeah I, I i also there's a bunch of stuff that like my parents have told me and like we have some weird photographs too that mm. are really cool um and uh, you uh so there's this one photograph we have so this is all early 90s early 2000s that time frame so it's on a stage pictured down the bar in the middle of the frame there is a post and when the photo got developed against this post, there is a shadowy figure and you can make out like a bowler hat, um, mustache, cane of someone that was very much not there because there's a waitress walking through this frame and like very much not in focus. 
Uh, that was that was a weird photo. I would really like to see that if you ever find it again. Yeah, it's it's floating around my house uh, up in up in Maine. So when I go back up there, yeah. I'll take a picture and I'll send it Hell to yeah. you. Hell yeah, yeah. Um, and then just stuff with my uh, stories that my parents told me. Um, kitchen staff uh, couldn't find their hammer that they were tenderizing meat with, so they went downstairs to the basement, old basement. Um, with brick walls and everything and they grabbed a brick out of the wall um fun fact they later knocked down one of these walls and found a room that had been used on the underground railroad whoa with like a cot and a barrel and a vase like in this room like holy behind, shit sealed behind a wall <laughs> fuck yeah so this is an old building old building yeah damn 1832 i think it was built Wow. So yeah. You know spring water's like that? Yeah. Like all this bar in all this bar in Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. I, I hear people say oldest bar in Nashville a lot. And I'm like, I'll correct them and be like, no, oldest bar yeah. in Tennessee. Do you think they took out the carpets or do you think they're just worn away? At spring water? <laughs> yeah. I've never thought about it. That's wild. <laughs> I mean, I would imagine they took them out. Otherwise, I, there'd be remnants of it. <laughs> I, I like to think that it's just been so long that they're they just wore away. It's been just stomped into dust. Yeah, <laughs> that's wild. Yeah, but uh, anyway, so they grab this brick to go tenderize meat, and they walk upstairs. They wrap it in foil and they start banging it. Um, and suddenly, like a bowl of French flat fries flies across the room. Like some a bunch of knives fall off. Like the jar of croutons fall over and so they went back downstairs and like put it back um it's like, and multiple this is not uh like multiple people saw this yeah multiple people saw that um there was another one uh what there was one that happened while someone was on stage so it was um this blues musician he's a uh, harmonica player his name is uh, james montgomery um he was playing at, he was doing a normal gig as he does up there and uh he has his harmonica box that he normally has everything like in all nicely lined up and everything um he's playing the set suddenly power flickers the pa gets cranked up like the knobs get turned mm -hmm. a dimed all the way up and his harmonicas are all over the place on the stage and like this happened in front of like people <laughs> whoa yeah but like stuff like that happened and people have stayed the nights there and like talked about weird stuff it's like happening. a famously haunted place famously haunted place yeah for what's, sure what's the name of this place john stone's inn now it's called stone's public house um but john stone's inn is the original one john stone opened it wow that's super cool yeah <laughs> so um to your recollection you haven't experienced anything like that yourself except you did you just don't remember yeah the, for the most part i can remember like there were definitely some parts of that building that were like strangely cold mm -hmm. and like there are some some things of that nature that i definitely remember and just like unsettling feelings mm -hmm. um I, yeah, don't, I don't i don't discount any of that uh, i don't i i don't either um but i i can't personally say that i have experienced sure something crazy because there's a whole bunch of things that are hard to explain yeah that's true and i don't want to be one of those people that's like ghosts violate the laws of thermodynamics because that's <laughs> not fun <laughs> it's more like it works a certain way again like it works a certain way we just don't understand it right mm -hmm. it's like maybe we don't understand thermodynamics right um i never had anything weird happen to me until like i sought it out like i like got into magic yeah and, like tried tried to make things happen um, but like as a kid, I never experienced anything supernatural. Um, but I always, especially um, skeptics, which you don't sound skept like a skeptic, um, but I especially like hearing stories from skeptics. Yeah. Because some of them have some really crazy stories. 
And they're just like, yeah, I don't know what to do with that experience. Yeah. I, I guess I had like a really crazy hallucination or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but those, those are always like the most interesting to me when someone's like not particularly interested in that kind of stuff and they have a crazy story. Yeah, no. And uh, I definitely agree with you. That's, that's very interesting. And I'm not, I'm not a skeptic. And I guess I do like you. You're I open-minded. Mean, I can open-minded see and like, I like I like truth. I like seeking mm-hmm. truth. Me too. So keeping that open mind until you can figure it out. Um, like for example, I I was at my friend's house one day. He has this balcony that overlooks um you can see a mile down because it's way up high. You can see a mile down, there's the ocean. We're standing up there one day, big green light shoots across the sky. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't like a shooting star or anything because like someone was able to go look at that light and all of us were able to turn around and then still see it. Did you see it too? Yeah. Big old green light like going across the sky and it disappeared. In in retrospect, what do you think about that? A piece of copper burning up in the atmosphere. Uh, Space junk. But like I, I, which is a whole thing that I can rant about. Space junk is a real problem, people. Space junk. Um, no, yeah, that that makes sense. Do you think, like, like obviously there's life out in the universe, right? Like, but do you think, do you think intelligent life has visited Earth, or conversely, is currently here? Um. I don't know about, I mean, so we're going to talk about like ancient alien stuff for a second. I know people, aliens, (laughs) aliens. I know people love talking about like, oh, but the Aztecs did the same thing facing in the same direction over here. And it's like, well, maybe there's, I mean, like, that's really cool. And there's a lot of really cool conjecture to draw on that. Maybe it's also a really effective way of stacking rocks on top of each other so they don't fall down. And like the sun brings us life. So let's face the sun. Sure. And also, I don't have TikTok. I'm going to stare at the sun and see <laughs> how it moves. <laughs> that is legitimate. Is that a trend? I, I know. But oh, like, I see what you're, you don't. But, okay. But like that saying. was people's jobs. Like, like we can be as my, like it is mind blowing that people were able to have such accurate maps of the stars, like sail the seas and everything. Mm. And like, if your entire life was surviving and studying the stars, like you probably will figure something out. Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like we're not any smarter than the people who came before us in a lot of ways. We're dumber. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, we're, we're so we're, we are low bitrate cyborgs at <laughs> yeah. this point. We have it just like it's always attached we're, to us. We're cyborgs, but our ping is terrible to like our central. Yeah, nerve. like we're just our brain is so far away. But it's, oh, yeah. in this country, at least, or like a lot of places in the Western world, like that's an Eastern world. Like it's just how it is, how it's grown. But for sure, um, as far as aliens being here now. Uh, don't know it's possible because if there are aliens i believe they would either have technology that is way behind us and would not have gotten here or way ahead of us and which would be probably undetectable Mm. yeah i mean i don't see any reason why you couldn't like like just fuck with perception to be complete like like there's one standing in the corner of the room and it is just bending light in such a way that we would never notice it or something. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, it's, it's not strange to me to think that they would just be invisible to us. Yeah. Um, I, I, I am like, uh, conspiratorial and I tend to be into the weird, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, 
also tried to be logical and rational about it mm -hmm. um, and sometimes fail. But I like I liked what the points you made is like it's almost a disservice to human ingenuity to oh, point at for sure stuff people have done and be like, oh, that must be aliens. Yeah, I mean like like pyramids all over the world were built by throwing human life at it. Like that's a huge disservice to be like aliens lifted the rocks. No, thousands of people died in these projects. Sure. Like, and no. I have no connection to anyone that lived 5,000 years ago in, uh, you know, in Peru or in Egypt or anything, but like, they were still people, they did things and it's, isn't it, is it cooler to think that humans are capable of great things or is it cooler to think that we had help with everything along the way? And like it, they're both cool in a way, but so um, I have this other philosophy that worship is like a part of like an inevitable part of consciousness. Like I think that in uh one meaning or another everyone worships something yeah um and if you're not intentionally worshiping something then you're unintentionally worshiping something you know what i mean by that definitely yeah um i mean people are wired to look for something greater mm -hmm. than themselves and that can be in any way. And I think now we have ways that you can find solace in something greater than yourself that is actually not. That, yeah. That's, I think that's very easy. Oh, yeah. Um, I think it's also like inevitable. Like, this is something people do. Mm -hmm. um, I would say absolutely. Um, and, you know, we don't we don't have to put the word worship on it. But like, we all have like, an archetypal ideal that we aspire towards and it doesn't have to be a god it could be a, a character i mean from something you read yeah i mean taylor swift like <laughs> oh that's that's idolatry yeah that gets in yeah that's a very interesting example yeah and but i mean like people worship their playstation mm people live their lives on like being able to get platinum trophies. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm big on that. I'm big yeah. on that too. I love, I love those, those dopamine hits. I'm currently working through the platinum of last of us two right now. And we were talking about that earlier. Yeah. Um, and I, I love that, but I can, I've also can think back on times in my life where I was worshiping the thing like that was so much of my life and like, where I put and so much time, energy, money in a way that it was beyond just enjoying it. It was like, this is, this gives me meaning in a way. Like, is, is it, yeah. is getting meaning from something a part of worshiping it? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. It's not hedonistic. It's a, an aspiration that may not be fun because you make a good point about like trophy hunting. Like I just, I just platted Resident Evil 8 and by the end of that, I wouldn't say I was having a good time. Yeah. No, there's so many, <laughs> there are a bunch of platinum trophies where I'm like, I don't know why I actually did this. Yeah. Did I actually have fun like doing every tiny little thing in Cyberpunk 2077? <laughs> did I need to find every soda can with a weird <laughs> marking in uncharted four to you know it's like did but like yeah but there's something that we get from that yeah part of my intentional worship is um and you know like i'm not i'm i don't really focus too much on the literalism versus yeah. the symbolism it's just not an area i'm like super interested in but like at least in a, like a symbolic, like this archetype, you know, yeah. um, I really like 
Prometheus and um, like this divine handing down of the torch. So the question you asked earlier about like, is it cooler if there is like alien or divine involvement or is it cooler if people just did it on their own? Um, I think it's probably cooler if people just did it on their own. I'm not entirely convinced. I think when it comes to ingenuity, it's, it's like a combination of a few things. Mm-hmm. Um, like I've had, and I've, I've told these stories on here before, so I won't get too deep into it, but um, like, like with the board here, I've done a lot of channeling and when you start studying something like chaos magic, there's like basically two schools of thought. Mm-hmm. There's left-hand path and there's right-hand path, which is I'm channeling a higher source or I'm just fucking around with my own subconscious. But the subconscious is so vast, like as vast as the universe. Yeah. Yeah that I don't know that there's an observable difference because um, as much as I would love to be wrong about this, um, I've done a lot of spirit work, but I've never experienced poltergeist activity, like Mm -hmm. something. Now I've heard a bunch of stories about it. Like I ask everyone who comes on the show about it. Yeah. I've heard a bunch of crazy shit. I would like to believe that, but I've like, like I'm a seeker when it comes to those kind of interactions. And I've personally never experienced anything like that. Um, so I don't be, because I'm skeptical about poltergeist stuff, I can't really tell any, tell anybody whether this is all in my head Mm -hmm. or whether it's external. Um, and I think ultimately the answer I've come to, at least right now, is that it's, it's a collaboration. Like there is something that you're collaborating with. So imagine that there's this shapeless form that you put in a box, like you give attributes to it Mm -hmm. and your imagination collaborating with this thing is like a handshake. So I think it's a mix of imagination and uh, something external, but I really have no fucking clue. Yeah. Um, I think when, when it comes to, like chaos it's all about practicality it's like what can we do like with the mind and at that point magic becomes kind of an obsolete term where all of these things have been explained with psychology it's very like just union psychology so um i still like using magic terminology because it's fun yeah definitely it's like a poetry to it but all these things can be rationalized with psychology like hypnosis is so powerful like we used to see like in the fifties and stuff, you would see examples of it on TV. We don't really see that anymore. No, They don't demonstrate that because they're doing it on a mass scale and they don't really want people to be aware of how much you're we're fucked with. Yeah. But um, like that is an adequate explanation in and of itself that you can just program people. Mm hmm. And you can do this to yourself. You can trick yourself into believing in something and then manifesting it. Like you can make an apparition appear. That doesn't mean it exists, right? Right. You just have control over your observation. But yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. And have you ever been into um just tangent real quick? Have you ever been into hail next to the East Room? No, someone I know I know what you're talking about. The taxidermy oddity shop. Yeah, I haven't been in there because it there's parts of it that actually make me uncomfortable. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I've heard I've heard about people going in there and having like weird experiences and like getting like physically ill in like certain parts of the building. Someone just sorry, sorry, Hale. I'm not trying to like <laughs> I'm not trying to like shit talk your business, but I just hear you got some pretty <laughs> powerful energies in there, and I would love to be courageous enough to come into your shop. I will try one day. I guess I have to now. <laughs> that's that's funny because to me that's an advertisement yeah it's like oh okay i'm intrigued but it's we were talking about synchronicities earlier like um uh wizards maybe do it yeah you since you've been working on that and since leading up to this release you've been seeing wizards everywhere someone just told me i need to go to hail like a couple days ago yeah 
Um, and it's, it's just that, um, I won't, well, I won't sidetrack too much on this, but when I take LSD, I, weird things happen to me outside of just me hallucinating, hmm. like really okay. strange events, even like the day before and like day of before I took it. And then definitely during the experience, <laughs> right things that have nothing to do with me tripping like actual weird synchronicities happen it seems to be like huh. a side effect but it, there's not wow do you even call that a side effect like what the fuck is that right yeah no that is that is weird you ever experienced that or i mean like just not you know not with drugs but just like secret i guess you have because we were talking yeah, about the I mean, thing. just like that and I, it's kind of like the phenomena of where you buy a new car and then you suddenly see your car everywhere on the road. Mm. Like that, there, I don't, I, there's definitely like something weird how that all lines up of things telling you. I mean, my, uh, my girlfriend is really big in signs and like I've gotten a little bit into that as well. And just like seeing certain numbers now, like mm. regularly, it's like, oh, that is, that is odd. Like, uh, anytime I see, three twos i immediately relax mm. um huh because three twos is the magic number of being in the right place at the right time interesting yeah um i don't know about a lot about numerology that's really cool and then when my album came out to 22 minutes and 21 seconds i was like sweet <laughs> oh it just happened that way yeah <laughs> dude that's crazy yeah i was like sweet this is cool <laughs> man that's so awesome well, thank you so much for talking with me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, we should do it again. <laughs> I would love to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll do some. We'll give this one some room to breathe. Yeah, definitely. But I would definitely love to talk more with you about some weird shit. Yeah, let's do it. Check out Christian Northover's new album out. When this comes out, it'll be up tomorrow. Uh, Wizards made me do it. It's really cool. Very. You've never heard anything like it. Uh, other people have done drums and fx pedals but not this way yeah it's uh it's really cool um go listen to it it's streaming everywhere tomorrow october 25th 2024 and you'll be at the basement on the 30th yeah i'll well. be at the on the, at the basement on the 30th uh with mulu um so if you want to come out to a hip-hop show a halloween hip-hop show come on out it's going to be a blast um two other things uh Spirit Ritual band I play in. We just came out with uh, the first full length album. So yeah. you can go stream that everywhere. Uh, it's called The Last Time for Everything um, by Spirit Ritual. And I play in a Christmas band. So uh, go check out King Kazoo and the Reindeer Band um, when you feel like you can start listening to Christmas music. Whoa, first I heard of that. <laughs> yeah. You're, man, you're full of surprises. That's crazy. <laughs> yep. I uh, got to keep you on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next week, Alice. Nice to meet you, Alice.